Uh, so first up, we have Shay Brown for your last Praxis presentation. Yeah. Complexity patterning, a language and strategy for the teaching and learning of complexity competence. Thanks, Anna. Thank Everybody hear me all right? Yeah. I'll try not to get too loud to get excited. So even though I've done this before, I still am using notes. It's just the way it is. So today I'm presenting a very brief overview of my doctoral project, which is focused on the language and strategy for the teaching and learning of complexity competence, and it's called complexity patterning. Now, education is the main site for preparing young people for their participation in the emerging future. That can't be disputed. Therefore, teaching and learning needs to support students to gain the knowledge and skills that they need to engage in effective responses to the challenges facing humanity, and we all know that. Complexity competence is one such skill. It comprises complexity, embodied complexity sentience, which is perception, thinking, and knowing, and complexity consciousness, which is the understanding, as well as using it as a practical strategy for application in a range of ways. And you can see the four patterns that make up the design, and I'm going to actually go into those in more detail in a moment. But I'd really like you to remember that complexity patterning is not modelling. So please put aside any considerations of exact representation. That's not what this is about. It's an educational strategy and process, which then provides a very sound foundation for complexity understanding that can then be taken into any other field of endeavour. I'm going to give you a very brief definition of what complexity is for those people who are not familiar with it. Western knowledge has gone through a period, a very long period, of imagining that life and the universe is a machine. And along with that, there's um, conceptions of simple cause and effect, linearity, and capacity to predict, capacity to measure everything, and capacity to control. And as has come now first through quantum science, there's the understanding that that's actually not true, that those are humanly generated ways of understanding the universe. And the universe itself is actually a fractal holographic patterned organism entity and that none of those previous ways of understanding it really work, which is why we've got all these um, surprising results going on around us because we've been thinking about it all in the wrong way. And, of course, this is not new knowledge because Indigenous people have known this since forever. So it's come back around through science. That's so very, very interesting. And the word complexity covers that understanding of the universe. So just to give you a bit of a definition. And we are at a really crucial time right now in human history with a window of possibility to purposefully learn and develop the complexity competence, not just the understanding but the practical competence to, to maintain and regenerate conditions for life to thrive on this planet. And to do that, we need ways of living that engage and that indeed operate within complexity for the health of all species. The 2018 Global Education Report places complexity thinking and understanding as one of the most widely, in their top two or three, required capacities for the 21st century for all young people. There is a global movement in innovative and transformational education across the planet, which focuses um, on young people understanding complexity, and that's what this project aims to contribute to. And this shift is greatly contributed by all of us understanding ourselves as complex phenomenon, as homo complexus, rather than homo sapien, homo complexus. And then as attractors in all wider fields of uh, complex phenomena. Complexity patterning is one response to all of these challenges. I'm sure there are many more, but this is the one that I'm engaged with. And using patterning makes it a biometrically aligned to the complex dynamics of the world's coming into being. And I want to look at some of the science behind that statement. If we think of patterning as the process of the world's coming into being, and in quantum field theory, Theoretical physicist Karen Barad describes all life as diffractional with non-localised waves in fields patterning to generate standing waves that then generate as localised particles into matter. And similarly, fractal patterning is described as constituting materialised holographic forms in the quantum field by Laszlo and Laszlo. 
And Majer and others similarly describe a sub-quantum field that informs the quantum field, which is a patterning process manifesting time and matter. And they emphasise toroidal and spiral patterning as fundamental in this process of the world coming into being in, as both time and matter. And in the field of cosmology, it's been recently discovered that galaxies move, exist and interact with each other in coherent patterns. And as I said before, patterning knowledge is not new. It's a very, very fundamental ancient human knowledge. And Indigenous people have known this is forever. It's the basis of Indigenous science. They understand the world in this way. And Indigenous uh, cultures use pattern thinking and pattern languages as a way to co co-creatively engage with complex phenomena. And that includes ancient European Indigenous cultures way, way back, which is where I think the understanding comes through my DNA line from way, way back. Now, phenomena resist one form of description and one form of knowledge. So we need a broad transdisciplinary approach to understanding complex phenomena. So these, these knowledges and, of course, complexity science are the knowledges that underpin my work as the theoretical ecology of complexity patterning. So I will now describe complexity patterning and some of its implementation to you, what I've been doing with it. Um, and what we did... This, I introduced the students to these patterns that you find a, what's called a cross scale in the universe from the subquantum all the way through to the cosmic and you find very similar patterns appear across scale. It's called scale similarity. So the first thing I did was introduce the students to these patterns. We looked at branching forms. And in this way, the students understood the patterns before they used them. Branching forms, nerve cells, the entire nerve and blood systems of the body, trees, mycelial networks, rivers, estuaries, scale similarity of branching patterns. And the red images up there are interesting because one of them is a mouse neuron and one of them is a representation of the entire universe. Look how similar they are. And the one on the right is um, a representation of the internet, which also introduced to the students that humanly constructed phenomena also follow the, these, these scale similar patterns. So humans are very involved in these patterning processes as well. And we discussed branching forms as effective for maximum communication. That's what branching patterns do, maximum communication and exchange of energy, information and matter. That's what branching forms are for, maximum exchange. We discussed spherical forms from cells, fruit, planets, stars, and spherical forms are effective for holding energy in somewhat consistent form. So spherical and ellipsis are holding shapes and patterns. And spiral forms expressing movement and emergence in time. Where you see spirals is where there's time and movement um, of matter through time. And these three patterns are the basis of complexity patterning as used in the classroom with the students. Very simplified spiral pattern expresses time as nonlinear, complex phenomena, multi rhythmed, trans temporal experience, which is more than one time frame. It has seven phases, and all seven phases are repeated inside each one in a fractal manner on three levels, which makes it a complex pattern, even though it's very simple in form. The phases are not necessarily experienced chronologically, and you can be experiencing more than one at once across three levels, which makes it very complex. And it was first implemented to perturb and completely disturb the way linear time creates problems for students in high school. But they, so I unhooked their learning and becoming from linear time and taught them about how to engage with time as a complex phenomenon so that they weren't straightjacketed by linear industrial time, which causes, it's well documented now, um, Michelle Alderheff-Jones, uh, produced in 2017, a wonderful work called Time and the Rhythms of Transformational Education, and he described this effect in classrooms absolutely brilliantly. 
And the spheres pattern, which is, of course, used by many, many different people, and it expresses spatial and discursive arenas from personal embodiment to the planet. The difference with the way I'm using it here is, again, has three levels, and each phase is fractally, each sphere is fractally repeated inside each one on another level. So across three levels, you get a whole range of configurational possibilities, which makes it really useful for expressing complexity. And it also expresses the effect of boundaries and categories in human knowledge making because these are not fixed. You can move them. You could have three spheres. You could have one. You could have eight. You could do what you like with them. And the, the boundaries are all porous. And so the decisions that the students were making about these categories, they understood that they are making formative and co-generative decisions about knowledge and the effects of knowledge in the process of using the pattern because there's nothing fixed about this whatsoever. If they did something completely different with it, then that's great too. And the tree mycelial pattern is the emergence of entities through exchange and communication. We looked at it mostly in terms of flow of affordances and constraints, which is the, one of the easiest ways to understand this. It expresses relationality, uncertainty, bifurcation, and indeterminacy. And the branches and mycelial threads of the tree pattern move through the spheres pattern. And the fourth one, which is seed patterning, which is actually just a metaphor, but it's given pattern status so that I can say I've got four patterns. And seed represents, but no internal detail. So when configurations of the other three patterns completely dissolve, seed is a visual representation of chaos, transition, turbulence, all of those sorts of things, evolutionary shift, phase shift, transitions, and we use this when everything else just went completely to seed and everything just dissolved and we were in a bit of chaos for a while, we'd use this pattern and wait till the others and figure out how to bring a new configuration in. So it's really good for transitions. And a range of ecological metaphors were also used to embellish the pattern so that when they're used, you're using a very simple language that young people immediately understand. So it's very, very, very low cognitive load. But before I share with you some of the details of how it was implemented, I want to pay attention to two pieces of really relevant research. Yun Go and Zhang said that the most familiar phenomenon is the most effective when you're teaching complexity. So when I'm teaching complexity patterning to young people, I start with their own lives because it's the most familiar complex phenomenon that they know about. And young people are extremely interested in their own lives and where they fit in the world and what's actually going on around them. So it teaches complexity as an embodied, experienced um, knowledge that they're embedded in before teaching them that they are elements, if not attractors, in wider fields of complexity. You begin with them, who they are. And also doing it that way avoids the problem that Stella found in their, their research in 2020, that high school students have a tendency to think of the word complexity as something negative that you have to avoid. It's kind of seen that way. So beginning with their own lives, makes it just familiar, comfortable, easy. They're already in it and they already know it. So it's kind of an automatic learning. It's giving a language to something that they already experience is basically what it's doing. It's not teaching them anything new, but giving them a language for it. So I implemented this work with four cohorts of tertiary students and two of the cohorts were from Long Island University, New York, who are in Australia on the Asia Pacific leg of their global studies course. And you can see some of them there in the photo. And we patterned professional identity emergence together as related to intercultural communication because these young people were heading for careers in um, global sustainability projects with different cultures in situations of great complexity. So I was looking at their identity development and how that fitted with the people they were going to be engaging with. We focused on the spheres and mycelial patterns because they were the most useful at the time. And I showed them an example of my own professional identity patterning that I created very early in my candidature of where I would like to see myself go and what I would like to see my project doing. And you can see here's some of the students' patternings. Now, what these are is um, it looks just like very simple pictures, but these express very, very deep multidimensional understanding that was emerging in the students' consciousness and their cognition. And then they were talking about 
what they were doing. And one of the things that's really important about this, especially in high school, is that the knowledge is actually embedded and coded in their patternings. So none of the students are actually expressing anything that they don't want to express. None of them are being exposed in any way. And they will only tell you the story of what they want to tell you. So they don't have to tell you everything because it's not obvious. And that's really important looking after particularly high school students when you're doing this kind of stuff. Okay, rushing through. And the other two cohorts were um, a Bachelor of Science with Regenerative Ag major, students at Southern Cross University, and some general Bachelor of Science. So anyway, I'll show you some of the comments. I'll just let you read these. So this shows that they understand that it's about them and where they are. Whoop, go back, sorry. And as an identity development process. And keep in mind, this was the student's first introduction to the concept of complexity. And I think these comments speak for themselves about what they actually really got. And the last comment was when we were um, talking about using it, and I gave them an example of using it as a project planning tool for project planning, maintenance and evaluation. You can also use it that way. And this was uh, a comment from some of one of the regenerative ag students. And I particularly love this last comment. Absolutely love it because, of course, the whole reason for this project is to stimulate in increasing complexity patterning in the students' cognitive awareness and their own understanding. So I'm looking to complexify their brain functioning in the process of doing this with the material discursivity of the patterns themselves. I'm like, yes, if I've blown their little minds, then I'm completely happy. So yes, complexity patterning is one contribution to transformational education for the 21st century. It's adaptable for all ages. I'd like to write curriculum for five-year-olds and it can be used all the way up through tertiary education and for industry and community groups as well because it's got a low cognitive load. Young people are already complexity natives. As I said, we're not teaching them anything new. Young people are becoming more and more switched on. They're already there. It just gives them a language and a strategy to run with who they already are and what's already happening with them. Thank you. Okay, that's an incredible way of thinking. Uh, any questions? Yes, that was awesome. Um, Thank you. It, made, it reminded me of the ancient Indian Vedic texts, how they write about, like they describe the atom and things like thousands of years ago. I don't know if you came yeah. across any of that. All, all ancient knowledges. All. Yeah, it's, so it's fundamental human knowledge yeah. to understand the universe in terms of patterns. Mm. Yeah. So cool. Oh. Uh, from like a biological, psychological point of view, I think it's really cool that the tree is like what we're already made of, right? It's all the neurons. It's what we, that's yeah. what we are. Yeah. Uh, uh, can you explain that a little bit more about the, the patterns and how it, it is part of who we are? Well, that's why I start with the scale similarity of the patterns of the nervous system, because the students then make that connection immediately and go, oh, I'm already in a branching pattern um, communication with the universe because um, neurology and biology says that mind and even sensory engagement doesn't stop at your skin, that we're all embedded in the wider fields of, of complex phenomena. We just are, that we're perceiving you know, some of us more than others, I guess, and depending on what day it is and how you feel. But um, the, that's why I start with those pictures because then it's an easy connection. I already am that, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it stops it being something foreign, like a positivist knowledge. It's embodied. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But they are, you know, complex phenomena existing within wider fields of this patterning process. Amazing. You could start with four-year-olds. Let's all be trees. You know, it's like amazing stuff you could do. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thank you, Shay. Um, I wanted to ask a question. You said you like to write curriculum for, you know, a whole range. This, to me, has instant applications to initial teacher education. Yes. Does it? And teacher professional learning, teacher identity. Yeah. And then it feeds into so many other parts. So yeah. I hope that's on the agenda too. <laughs> I hope so too. Well, and I'm I hope that we can all be part of that. All that sorts would be of exciting. possibilities. Well, what was interesting too in the classroom, I was using it to deconstruct literature, to consider history as a classroom culture management tool. They were all part of the one one patterning and the one tree. And because you use a field of a um, whole lot of metaphors, you're not using psychological or, or disciplinary language of any description. You're just using metaphors and shared dynamics. Not really much of a question, um, more of a comment and a thank you, really. Um, being a high school maths teacher, I'm always looking with my students for the patterns that are in everything. But what I'm wanting to take away this morning is a change in my language, and I really hope that it sticks, that patterns aren't in everything. Patterns are everything. Everything patterns into existence. Just patterns yeah. are everything. Yeah. And they're just I've had a little penny drop moment, and just thank you so much. That was incredible. Yeah, it's great. That's why I investigated the quantum physics, because I'm taking this back and back and mm. back and back. Is it just some cute idea that I'm having? No, this is actually the way the world operates, which is why it's in all of the different knowledges all the way through. Maybe we've been learning this all the way through. Seems so obvious now, doesn't it? Thanks Thank so you much. so much, Shay.